So hello and welcome to the afternoon portion of our symposium today. My name is Mimi Marziani. I am counsel here at the Brennan Center. Uh, in the democracy program, I spend most of my time in the campaign finance project with all of these uh, wonderful people you've seen today. And uh, before we begin, I just wanted to look back at this morning's um, discussions and then we can look ahead to what's to come. This morning's remarks made one thing very clear. Citizens United was a game changer. And last year's election gave us a preview of post-Citizens United elections to come. As Chairwoman Bower Bowerly described, last election, tens of millions of dollars from powerful special interest groups, including business corporations, were spent to influence the electoral process. This did two things. One, it pushed voters and grassroots organizations to the side. And perhaps even more alarming, if that's possible, is that these spenders were allowed to do this without disclosing their identity and therefore escaping all political accountability. And so we've talked a bit about um, the public's anger and um, some of the consequences of this spending. Unfortunately, it is clear to many of us that, well, <laughs> It's indisputable that Congress has uh, thus far failed to enact any reform. And uh, unfortunately, given the hyperpartisan nature and the perpetual, perpetual gridlock in Washington, D.C., in that part of Washington, D.C., I know many of my wonderful panelists are from Washington, D.C., um, it is actually unlikely that uh, we will see any robust reform coming from Congress anytime soon. And so, uh, the second panel of uh, today's symposium will identify non-legislative strategic pressure points to facilitate accountability and political spending. And perhaps some of these strategies could be implemented in advance of the 2012 election. First, we will discuss corporate governments, governance strategies that do not focus on shareholders. Then. We will examine various plans to use the administrative rulemaking process through the IRS, the FEC, the FCC, to give voters more salient information about political spending. Finally, we will take a practical look at these proposals and consider their real world implications. Our panelists are leading academics and practitioners. Mm -hmm. Each has a long resume of very impressive accomplishments. Uh, I don't even have time to go into all of those accomplishments today, but I urge you to read all of their bios in um, your program. Um, very quickly, though, in order of appearance, we have Bruce Freed, the founder and president of the Center for Political Accountability. Then we have Holly Shadler, a partner at Tristan Ross Shadler and Gold. And then we have Professor Ellen April, the John E. Anderson Chair in Tax Law at Loyola Law School. And finally, we have Mark Elias, a partner at Perkins Coie and chair of the firm's political law practice. One last thing, to streamline the presentation, I ask that you hold your applause until the end of the panel. And uh, we will have time for questions, but please, uh, out of courtesy, try to keep your questions uh, short and sweet. Thank That's you. optimistic, assuming there'd be applause. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to, to be with all of you this afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be with uh, our partners and friends uh, who have been working with us, with us in the effort on corporate political accountability. And my colleague Valentina Judge is here this afternoon, and she's been here all day, uh, partic you know, just uh, participating in the program. As a non-lawyer on today's program, I'd like to go talk about going outside the legal and political system. Uh, specifically, I want to focus on how corporate governance is being used to achieve corporate political accountability and bring accountability to the relationship between companies and trade associations uh, and to the disclosure of corporate contributions to secretive C4 groups. Taking the corporate governance route helps surmount the obstacles that we're finding uh, that are really posing problems to achieving change. The Supreme Court's hostility to regulation of corporate political spending and the paralysis or inaction of the enforcement aid and regulatory agencies, specifically the IRS and the Federal Election Commission. 
Today, I think the, you know, the threat from hidden political spending and the use of trade associations and C4s as conduits for that spending only gets worse. Associations and C4s are the real problem because there's no disclosure of their funding, and we've seen hundreds of millions of dollars that's being pumped into the system, and a great deal of that money is coming from corporations. The Citizens United decision created or really exacerbated that problem, and today you have independent expenditures that are really the new vehicle for corporate political spending. These independent expenditures can be done either directly by companies, we're seeing in most cases is being done indirectly through the conduits. And you're finding that companies are coming under real pressure, very serious pressure from political uh, figures and politically active trade associations for them to engage in that type of spending. We've talked about the risks that this poses to companies, the outcries from shareholders. What I'd like to do is move beyond that now and really focus on the innovative strategy that the Center for Political Accountability developed that really predates Citizens United by seven years. I think this is important because we're finding that the CPA strategy combines corporate governance, direct corporate engagement, and advocacy to achieve corporate political disclosure and accountability. And this was being done even before, well before the Citizens United decision was handed down. The CPA's goal, and really the goal of the strategy that CPA and its partners has been following, has been to uh, achieve disclosure and accountability. And I want to underscore that point. We see the two as going hand in hand, and we see them as critical into to changing the way corporations participate in the political process by bringing accountability to direct and indirect political spending and accountability to the relationship between companies and their trade associations. I think what's so important about this strategy and what makes it so unique is that it is not vulnerable to political obstruction or legal challenge. This is a strategy that goes directly to the companies and focuses on directly engaging the companies. There are four elements to the strategy that has been carried out over the past seven years. The first is to engage companies by approaching them or directly uh, or by filing a shareholder resolution. Uh, the CPA developed, uh, drafted a model political disclosure resolution that our partners have been filing. It's one that has passed muster at the SEC, which makes it very important and uh, a good vehicle to use. The second element is to seek to enter into a dialogue with companies. Some companies will go into a dialogue without, filing of a without the filing of a resolution. Others need a resolution to bring them to the table. The third element is to reach an agreement with a company to adopt political disclosure and board oversight of their political spending with corporate funds. And I underline that corporate funds, not the PAC uh, spending, which is already disclosed, but the undisclosed corporate uh, funding. The disclosure includes the company's decision-making policies and procedures for its political spending. And political spending is defined broadly in our effort. It covers the soft money contributions and payments to trade associations associations and other tax-exempt organizations that are used for political purposes. And this includes independent expenditures made directly or indirectly by a company. Lastly, once an agreement is reached, we monitor the company's activities and adherence to the agreement, and we work with the companies to strengthen or expand the poli their policies and practices on political disclosure. Companies have been doing this this is very important to assure that the effort is not static and that it really changes with conditions. Our corporate governance approach today is bringing about real change. And I want to go through what the examples are because I think that's very important to see what has been able to be achieved where you've had paralysis or hostility elsewhere. Eighty-five large public companies, including 51, that's more than half, of the trend-setting S&P 100 have adopted political disclosure and accountability. What that does is creates a beachhead that you work from. The leaders in disclosure and accountability today include Aetna, Dell, Exelon, Merck, Microsoft, Norfolk Southern, Pfizer, and Prudential uh, Financial. These are companies, for the most part, we have worked with, developed relationships worth, and have shown, and have shown a commitment to political disclosure and to making it even more robust. The conference board, the nation's leading business research organization, has recognized political disclosure as a risk. It asked CPA to write a handbook on corporate political activity. That handbook was released on the eve of the election, 
It sets out the emerging best practices for disclosure, approval, and board oversight of political spending by companies, and also creating an ethical culture for uh, within companies on handling their political spending. And what's interesting is that the handbook is really being used by companies and by election lawyers who are advising corporate clients. Companies are including political spending in their codes of conduct or creating codes of conduct for political spending. This has been the case with Dell, Intel, Merck, and Microsoft. We're also finding that companies are beginning to place restrictions on the use of their money for political purposes. They're doing it them for themselves, and they're also doing it with trade associations. It's just beginning, but the fact that this is starting is extremely important. These restrictions apply to independent expenditures, electioneering communications, and state judicial elections. And companies that are doing this include Merck, Microsoft, Wells Fargo, and Unum. Uh, and some of the companies are now asking their trade associations to confirm that they are adhering to the restrictions. We're also working uh, with companies on uh, developing ways to make these restrictions meaningful and effective. Secrecy is being peeled back on corporate uh, company payments to trade associations and on the company trade association relationship. As a result of agreements with CPA and its partners, 18 companies disclosed payments to the chamber totaling 5.2 million for 2009, and some of the companies are cutting payments to the chamber as a result of follow-up engagement by the shareholders. The proxy advisory services are recognizing political spending as posing a risk, and that's been important because they've been recognizing, uh, uh, they've been re uh, recommending for practically all of the CPA model political disclosure resolutions. This has meant, uh, the, the effect of this is that the vote, the average vote for the uh, model resolution topped 30% in the 2010 proxy season. Uh, it was above 30% at 15 companies, and at four companies it exceeded 40%. And it sends a strong message to companies and puts serious pressure on them to adopt political disclosure. Lastly, company contributions are being scrutinized much more closely by shareholders and the media. We saw that uh, in the case of Target after it made the contribution to uh, Minnesota Forward. Companies recognize now, and this is something that I found when I've been speaking to general counsels, corporate secretaries, they're really much more sensitive to what the implications could be. They look at Target. Target really for them was a wake-up call uh, for, for the need to pay much closer attention and to begin to start looking at how can they stay away from this. What's next? I think this is extremely important. We've talked about what we have achieved, where are we, where do, what can you look forward to, what are the new things that are going forward. CPA is developing the first ever index to rate companies on their political disclosure and accountability policies and practices. This is very important because it's going to be the first index doing this. So we developed 30 indicators, uh, we're doing the data collection now, we have a scoring advisory committee made up of leading people in the social responsible investment community who have expertise in scoring and academics. So we're assuring that this is going to be rigorous and will be accepted. Uh, it, the uh, indicators are based on the handbooks, emerging best practices. The index starts off with the S&P 100. You'll have that for 2011. will be expanded to the S&P uh, 500 for 2012. And what we found is that the index data collection has already spurred some companies to strengthen their political disclosure policies and practices to get a higher score. Merck and Microsoft, for example, want to be at the top of the list. You have companies like Altria, a pariah, but Altria has wanted to be a leader in political disclosure. I just received an email this morning informing Valentina and me about the changes that they have adopted. So, I mean, you know, you begin to see these changes. Exelon, Exelon sent a detailed response to the, the indicators uh, that what we sent to them and the other S&P 100 companies. Uh, the CPA is following up on the Handbook on Corporate Political Activity now with a primer that we're writing for the Council of Institutional Investors for directors on how to conduct meaningful oversight of their company's political spending. That's extremely important. If you're going to make accountability important uh, and effective and start having a change on the way companies are engaging in political spending and the political process. We see the index, the handbook, and the primer 
providing companies and directors with the guidance that will help them better manage and avoid the risks associated with direct and indirect political spending. A priority for the Center and its partners remains increasing the number of companies adopting political disclosure and accountability. This is absolutely critical for a move for having political disclosure move from being a best practice to a standard. Because as you see, you know, the difficulty for action in other areas, the corporate governance route and the informal, basically, rulemaking, regulation making is very, very important. I just want to close with the point that political accountability is being achieved through the strategic use of corporate governance and that a firm foundation has been laid for further advances. So where we talk about the, the frustrations that are followed in other areas, I think what's important to recognize is that there is movement, there is change, and we will see that going forward. Thank you. Uh, originally, when uh, we were planning this panel, I was asked to talk about the FEC Form 5, and that is the form that um, non-federally registered political committees um, report through. It's the, um, individuals, uh, corporations, and um, other types of entities that are not registered with the FEC. And since that time, there have been several developments alluded to by both Michael Waldman and um, Chairman Bowerly, addressing disclosure of independent expenditures and the sources of these expenditures. So we decided to change course. And um, so you will be spared my detailed discussion of Form 5, which I'm sure would be rather dull. Um, but um, I will say that prior to Citizens United, this form was not widely used. Um, it's primary. <laughs> Its primary use was by qualified nonprofit corporations, those corporations that um, are um, a very, very small slice of the nonprofit community that were permitted to make independent expenditures and use that form. And there might have been a smattering of other organizations using it, but it's one that I've worked with for many years. And um, I will simply say that there are any number of areas where the regulations and the instructions read together are not clear. Um, and these will really need to be addressed um, at a minimum to provide additional clarity for those many, many organizations that are going to be complying with the requirements now. And most of the disclosure discussion that we're going to have this afternoon will f circulate around that Form 5, because that's the foundation right now for all of this reporting. So instead, I'm going to talk um, briefly about a number of the challenges and proposals to revise and enhance the disclosure of political expenditures, and particularly the specific funding sources behind those um, expenditures. And largely, I'm going to describe these initiatives, and um, both Mark Elias and I will be um, making a few observations. I hope to queue up some of the questions that might come up um, in our discussion period. Most recently, Congressman Van Hollen, with the support of various um, campaign finance reform organizations, filed a petition of rulemaking to revise the regulations um, on disclosure of independent expenditures. The petition raises an issue that's actually been quite controver controversial for many years, and prior to Citizens United, so, um, so few groups were using these regulations and reporting under them that it really was not receiving much attention. But under the FEC's regulations, a Form 5 filer is um, required to um, report any contributor who gave an aggregate amount over $200 specifically for the purpose of furthering the reported independent expenditure. And we're going to get into a discussion about articles of speech <laughs> right now. The filer need not list contributors who don't earmark contributions. And in practice, very few contributors actually earmark contributions for a specific independent expenditure. They might give for the purpose of independent expenditures, or they might give generally to the organization with the hope that that might be the, per the use of the funds. But it's fairly unusual, not, not un um, 
not never seen, but um, fairly unusual that they'll give for the purpose of a specific independent expenditure. The language of the Federal Election Campaign Act, the statute, however, provides that all contributions made for the purpose of furthering, furthering an independent expenditure must be reported. And assuming the word an has a different meaning than the in this context, the statute sh may, would seem to be um, broader than the regulations are currently. And this is exactly what Van Hollen raised an issue about. He proposes the same language in his petition um, set out in the draft notice of proposed rulemaking presented by, we assume, the Democratic commissioners in January as part of the attempt to do a rulemaking in Citizens United. And that was not a successful attempt. There was, as um, Chairman Bowerly alluded to today, there was not, a, um, the commission couldn't get the four votes to um, even put out a notice of proposed rulemaking. But this uses the same language as is presented in one of those. Under his proposal, independent filers would be required to report the identification of each person who makes a contribution in excess of $200 within a calendar year and each person who makes a contribution during the reporting period in excess of 2,000 for the purpose of furthering an independent expenditure. So that's considerably broader language. If adopted, however, it's unclear precisely how much broader this language is than the current regulation. Since a contribution under the statute and under the regulations is defined as a gift or anything else of value for the purpose of influencing an election um, for federal office, the reporting required under this proposed language might be so limited as well. Therefore, it would cover contributions and anything of value contributed for the purpose of influencing a federal election. And it would seem to require reporting of any person who earmarked it for that purpose. But these are questions that obviously raise, are raised by this um, petition. They will, if this um, proceeds, certainly be debated vigorously, and we'll see what the outcome is. Van Hollen also, very shortly after that, um, challenged in federal district court the FEC's electioneering communications regulations on somewhat similar grounds, though the statutory provision um, is, is quite different. If an entity spends an aggregate of $10,000 um, or $1,000 within 20 days of an election to produce an air or, and air electioneering communications, the group must report these um, expenditures on a Form 9 and under the current regulations disclose each of its donors who contributed an aggregate of $1,000 or more for the purpose of furthering electioneering communications. That's what the regulations say right now. Um, unlike, the, unlike the provision for the independent expenditures, the statute requires disclosure of all contributors who contributed in excess of $1,000 to the entity that's, um, that's conducting the electioneering communication. The FEC amended the language after the decision in WTRL, sorry, WRTL, limiting the um, disclosure to contributions for the purpose of. So Van Halen argues that the FEC had no authority to revise its regulations in this manner, and we'll see where that goes. In another interesting development, the Media Access Project has filed a petition with the FCC. And um, again, its purpose is to augment disclosure of funding sources beyond the organization that's paying for the ad. Um, the current FCC regulations say that the broadcaster must be, is required to fully and fairly disclose the true identity of the person or group sponsoring the um, message. The petition takes the position that the FCC has broad discretionary authority to um, impose additional requirements, and this, this suggested language would have um, the broadcaster announce um, all donors that directly or indirectly provided at least 25% of funds for the payment um, 
of the advertisement. 10% um, of the funding of any donor who provided 10% or more of the funding would have to be listed in their um, broadcast, the broadcaster's files, public files, and be available to the general public. So there's some major implications for broadcasting um, regulations, and um, that is before the FCC right now, and we'll see how that fares. And finally, a draft executive order, apparently um, a current project of the administration, was leaked and would um, require entities that submit offers um, for federal contracts to disclose political contributions and expenditures made within two years prior to submission of the offer. It's a fairly straightforward proposal. Um, federal contractors are currently banned from making political contributions, but the um, specific order, the language of the order, seems to suggest that it would go beyond the federal contractors and cover subsidiaries, um, directors, officers of the entity that's um, filing the submission for a contract. So that'll be interesting to watch as well. Again, I thank everyone for having me here. Former FEC counsel Larry Noble stated that the major impact of Citizens United is that more money is going to 501c4 groups, trade groups, and others that don't disclose their donors. All of these are forms of tax-exempt organizations, and I'm a tax lawyer, so I'm gonna to talk to you about tax law. <laughs> So let me give you a little bit on the tax landscape so you can put this in context. We've already talked about charitable contributions. Charities are 501c3s under the Internal Revenue Code. We divide 501c3s into two other categories, public charities and private foundations. And we have many representatives of private foundations here today. Public charities are limited in how much lobbying they can do and they are prohibited from any campaign intervention. Private foundations essentially cannot do lobbying or any campaign intervention at all. Private foundations generally are grant-making institutions established by individuals, families, or corporations. They have a limited number of donors. Both private foundations and public charities get deductions for income tax purposes and gift tax purposes. But the distinction I particularly want to make is that under the Internal Revenue Code, under the statutes, we can have public disclosure of contributors to private foundations, but not to public charities. And these rules I just gave you are all statutory rules. When it comes to 501c4s, social welfare organizations, 501c5s, labor unions, labor organizations, 501c6, trade groups, chambers of commerce, trade association, they can do unlimited lobbying if it's related to their exempt purpose, and they can do campaign intervention if it's not their primary activity. Now, all of these are under various levels of IRS administrative pronouncements. None of this is in the statute. It's regulatory interpretation of the statute. If they do engage in campaign interventions directly rather than through a 527 organization, they are subject to a tax on the lesser amount, the lesser of the amount they spend on this campaign intervention or their investment income. These rules probably apply to the couple dozen other 501Cs, but we're not as sure. We don't have authorities. There is no income tax deduction for these organizations, and there's certainly no explicit exemption for gift tax purposes. That's been particularly important with 501Cs. The IRS, we hear, has recently undertaken an enforcement effort with 501Cs. If they audit a 501c4, they've also been auditing large contributors to it. We understand they're looking at states for transfers between family members. So for years of not having enforcement of the gift tax, we are starting to get enforcement of the gift tax. 
However, Congress for this year and next has also passed a law that says no gift tax out of pocket till you've spent more than $5 million. And we don't know what will happen to that in two years. Now, Senator Baucus, chair of the Senate Finance Committee, was particularly concerned about whether the IRS has been enforcing these rules about campaign intervention, four, fours, fives, and sixes. The IRS, in its announcement of its work plan for next year, said, yes, sir, yes, sir. We will look at fours, fives, and sixes. What that will mean, we're not so sure. We also have Section 527. 527 serves two very different purposes that can make it a little hard to follow. On one hand, it taxes any political organization, whether it's regulated by the FEC, by states, or by the IRS. Then it also has regulation, including disclosure, notification, by the IRS for political organizations that are not regulated by the FEC, because they do not engage in electioneering or express advocacy, or by states. The IRS, in the same annual report, said it looked at organizations regulated by the states and thought they were doing OK. So in Citizens United, the court didn't speak of tax issues, but one of the things it did was excoriate the FEC for its open-ended, rough-and-tumble use of factors. And how do we define campaign intervention under 501c3, 4, 5, and 6 with a set of factors? And with nothing else. <laughs> there is also no way to define what is primary activity for these organizations that cannot have campaign intervention as their primary activity. This is something the IRS could do by regs. There's a group of private practitioners and academics working on proposed regs to submit to the IRS. Another issue is that applications for exemption are required by a certain period for 501c3 organizations and a couple more obscure ones, not for C4s, in particular fives or six. Perhaps we could see an application required for these organizations. We get a lot of information from the application for exemption, we can compare it to their annual information report and see if they're doing what they said they would do. However, the requirement that C3s do it by a certain date is in the code. A former head of the IRS exempt org division has argued to me that he thought the IRS could do it by regulation because there's already a regulation that says any 501C shall file the form of application prescribed by the commissioner. I don't think the IRS is going to do that without congressional authority to say, require C4s, 5s, and 6s to file an application by a specific date. Then the last thing that's of the greatest concern to everyone is disclosure of donors. Currently, it is very explicit in the code that only private foundations and 527s can have public disclosure of contributors. All these organizations disclose it to the IRS for any contributions of 5,000 or more. The IRS has a form that Schedule B that gives this information, but the code is very explicit that no one else can do it. So thus, change would require Congress to act. The IRS clearly could do that. Given that the Disclose Act did not pass, I wouldn't bet on Congress doing it for C's, 4's, 5's, or 6's either. The one thought I've had, and I'm going to end with this, is maybe Congress would be more willing to follow a private foundation model and say, OK, we won't make all of the C4s disclose their donors. But if they have a limited number of donors, if they are funded by only a few people, and we have a very technical definition in the code that I will not trouble you with, that we will also require those kinds of C4s to disclose their donors. Maybe we could get Congress to do that. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying that um, uh, everything I'm about to say are my own views. Uh, none of them are the views of any of my clients. Um, it's fair to say that probably my clients probably disagree with me 
as often as they agree with me uh, on a lot of things, uh, and it's, they're not even the views of necessarily all the other uh, attorneys um, at my law firm. Um, like Holly, I had originally been prepared to discuss a very scintillating topic, which was the comparison of the rulemaking proposals put out by the Democratic commissioners and Republican commissioners, both of which failed. Leaving you, all, <laughs> leaving you all to wonder, well, why would you have taken up our time to talk about that? Um, but uh, luckily for you, I changed course. Um, and I was struck by Michael Waldman's introduction and then actually changed course again um, this morning. Um, and I, a couple of things struck me. First is that the title of this panel and a, a phrase that he used several times is pressure points. What are the pressure points? And, uh, some of what I have to offer this group you will agree with and some of which you will probably violently disagree with. Um, I've talked to a number of conservative-leaning organizations and told them that Citizens United is an odd case jurisprudentially for them to embrace for a whole host of reasons, probably mo many of which you know, and that for folks committed to judicial restraint, it's a weird case for them to have joined on to. Um, and one of the things that, that Michael said at the front end was the, that part of the goal here is to come up with a coherent jurisprudence, and in some respects that's right, uh, on the progressive or the reform side, and that's kind of what I'm, what I'm cautioning conservatives about, about embracing Citizens United too closely. Part of pressure points is not bludgeoning the entire body, right? If, you're, if your goal is to apply <laughs> pressure to a pressure point on the arm, you don't chop the arm off and you don't beat it with a two by four. And candidly, just as I provide unsolicited advice occasionally to conservatives, I'm now gonna <laughs> provide it to, to reform advocates, you gotta stop with the two by fours also. Um, the fact is we wind up with Citizens United because someone wanted to make a movie that honestly very few people in America really were clamoring to see. So I got an idea, how about we let them make the movie? Right? We wind up with actually a trilogy of cases, and this was another point that, 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 um, that Michael pointed out, and I, he used a great phrase, and I wish I could have remembered exactly, but he said basically Citizen United has become a brand mm -hmm. that encompasses a series of cases. One of those three cases, and not surprisingly, when, when um, at least one of the Republican FEC commissioners speaks about Citizens United, he always leads with Emily's List uh, as the first in the trilogy. Um, Emily's List wound up going to court. My, in disclosure, my firm and I represent Emily's List and represented them in litigation. Emily's List wound up in litigation because uh, the FEC passed a series of rules which, among other things, and there were other pieces of it, but among other things said that if a federal candidate signs a solicitation soliciting money for a state candidate in another state when they're not in cycle and none of their constituents get that piece of mail, right? So you have Senator from New York signs a piece of mail to raise money for a state legislative candidate in California. When the Senator of New York's not in cycle, and no one in New York is gonna get a copy of it, it'll only be mailed to people in California, the FEC rule said that has to be paid for 100% with, with hard money. 100% with hard money, because it was signed by a federal elected official. That case goes up to the D.C. Circuit, and of course the D.C. Circuit not only invalidated that rule, but invalidated much more than just that rule, and invalidated large pieces of the regulations. That was a pressure point rule that many in the reform community argued for, and I would say that between arguing that David Bossie and Citizens United couldn't make a movie, and arguing that that kind of financing rule was required by McCain-Feingold is part of where, at times, people who have meant well have not applied pressure points, but rather they have, they have decided to go significantly beyond that. Now, where do I think the pressure points have been successful? Um, I'm gonna offer one concrete and one perspective. One which is a concrete one, which honestly, uh, many in this room undoubtedly decry, but they should celebrate. Uh, Commissioner Bowerly mentioned, uh, I was counsel to an organization called Common Sense 10. And Common Sense 10 went to the Federal Election Commission and said, we want to register with the FEC and report all of our donors. We want to. We want to be here with the FEC reporting all of our donors of $200 and above and reporting all of our disbursements of $200 and above. We wish to disclose electronically, online, the whole searchable, sortable, right, the whole, the whole thing that you get with FEC disclosure. And we know we have a right to take corporate money, 
in unlimited amounts because we read that <laughs> opinion from the Supreme Court. So if we take corporate and labor money in unlimited amounts, can we file as a federal political committee and disclose it all? Now, the FEC said yes, but honestly, what I expected was a rush in from the reform community celebrating this as a win, right? Here it is, after all, trying to set the precedent that, in fact, these groups can, and there's a vehicle for them to disclose. Instead, there was a combination of silence and opposition. And every so often, this, the concept of super PACs gets brought up, and they get lumped in with various other organizations that don't disclose. Um, and I think if you want to have a strategy, a coherent jurisprudence going forward that is aimed at disclosure, and maybe it's not, but if it is aimed at disclosure, then you need to pick the pressure points. And the pressure points include that when groups come before the Federal Election Commission and say, we wish to disclose the corporate and labor funds we receive and the unlimited individual funds we receive, then that ought to be a point of celebration or a point of support, at least, from, from those who care about campaign finance reform and not opposition. The second is something that is, has not been, uh, has come up from time to time before the commission, which has not yet, um, uh, is not currently before the commission, but I would again put, put before this group. Um, several people have decried, and I have in many forums and settings, the effect that the current system has on the parties, right? The parties play a useful role in the system. The party, the national, the three national party committees on each side, six national party committees only raise hard money. They only spend hard money. Uh, all their money that they raise is disclosed. It's all regulated. It's all, all the money they spend is disclosed. Um, yet they are subject to a series of coordination rules that look like the same rules in, in the main that apply to soft money groups. Um, I don't think that that's actually what McCain-Feingold says. I think that McCain-Feingold actually said they couldn't do that, but the FEC did it anyway. One of the things that would be a pressure point would be to say, okay, let's find ways to advantage those spenders we think are playing a constructive disclosed uh, part of the process, the national party committees. Let's find ways to make them stronger in the process. Rather than focusing only on the other part, let's find ways to, find them, to make them stronger in the process. And rather than opposing efforts um, uh, to do so. So where does, this, where does this leave us from a regulatory standpoint? Right now, um, what we have is high costs in the system because of uncertainty. Um, I actually am more optimistic than probably anyone else that the FEC actually does work. Um, it deadlocks. It deadlocks a lot around ideological issues and big issues, but, you know, that doesn't mean that the agency isn't working. It's working in a lot of respects that, that uh, Chair Bowerly mentioned around disclosure and, and other things. Um, so one of my messages, I wouldn't give up on the FEC. There are obviously there are FCC pieces of this. There are pieces that can be done in the court. I think Congressman Van Hollen's litigation is an example of where you can take a pressure point approach to disclosure and try to advance that. Uh, try to advance that. But I would not give up on the FEC. And I would mention two things in particular. One is there is, I think, an opportunity for there to be um, a rulemaking process that works at the FEC. The FEC did deadlock in its, most effort, in its most recent efforts around Citizens United. But for those of you in this room who wish to find the pressure points to increase disclosure, I wouldn't give up on the FEC process. And I think people um, uh, would be well, well uh, spending good time investing in ways to try to break that logjam and move, move the, the rulemaking process forward. The second is, frankly, the advisory opinion process. The FEC advisory opinion process still works pretty well. Within 60 days, you bring them, a, you bring them an actual transaction, and within 60 days, they give you an answer. Uh, and I, it has been my experience that the, commission, the commissioners, by and large, try pretty hard to try to give an answer. It may not be the answer we always want, but an, an answer. And I think that we've seen that in the past as a vehicle that, that people trying to apply, apply pressure, to pressure to pressure points on one side or the other have used in the past, and I'd recommend that, um, that going forward. So with that, I will stop and... Wonderful. Um, and thank you all. I truly appreciate that you all can approach what can be a very um, controversial issue with common sense and sanity. I think that's to be applauded.
And as Mark, I think, noted, that's sometimes unfortunately too rare. Um, and I think I will lead off the question uh, period, but people should feel free to start lining up at the microphones. And so my question, and Mark kind of hit on this, but um, as an advocate, you know, as somebody who cares deeply about enhancing accountability and as a concerned citizen, um, what, you know, kind of one or top um, pressure point would you recommend to me as something that um, I could support and, would, and has a reasonable likelihood of success? And I'm thinking kind of a next, you know, what's our next step, in other words? And so anybody can, can kind of start. I was just going to say, I would sort of pick up two themes that I heard earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, I think Commissioner Bowerly pointed out correctly, the language in Citizens United around disclosure. Um, and not just in Citizens United, but in other cases around disclosure. And I am not, uh, uh, there are others who have spent a lot of time and, and think deeper thoughts than I do around what this jurisprudence is, but I think there is, there is certainly a, a way to tease out a jurisprudence around disclosure that frankly, right now, I think there is a reflexive answer to disclosure, mm -hmm. and I think that, that the Supreme Court has given the building blocks to create a more thoughtful jurisprudential position around disclosure. I would second that, and I wouldn't just look at Citizens United, though I don't think that's what anyone's suggesting. Um, in preparing for this, I went back to Massachusetts Citizens for Life, and it mm -hmm. has some very interesting passages about disclosure um, that, again, um, are not, uh, they're, they're measured. They, they seem, the court seems in, in certain passages in that um, opinion to have talked about what is necessary to achieve the end we're trying to achieve. And not, so it's not disclosure that is so burdensome that you end up ultimately um, either having a backlash, as sort of Mark was alluding to, or you have um, disclosure that is tantamount to what federal political committees are subject to, um, though, they're, though the organizations that are disclosing are not federal political committees. So I think going back to Massachusetts Citizens for Life is really important as well. And secondly, I would um, second this, um, this idea of looking at opportunities for advisory opinions, because I do think that that's a useful, um, a, a, a useful tool and one that is, um, has produced some real clarity um, in certain circumstances um, and could be useful in the disclosure as well. Do you have any thoughts? No. <laughs> really? One of the issues we have in tax is what the purpose of disclosure is in the tax laws and is it different in the tax laws and why we did it at the private foundation at the time we thought private foundations were subject, were doing all sorts of unfortunate things anecdotally, and whether we can really legitimately do that for C4s who do not get charitable contribution deductions, serve many different kinds of purposes, not all of whom engage in campaign mm -hmm. intervention. Mm -hmm. So what disclosure means in tax is opposed directly in campaign finance is an issue that needs its all jurisprudence mm -hmm. and further thinking. Mm -hmm. Hi. Bruce, I have a question. These the accountability, disclosure, transparency policies are being adopted in the C-suite. Mm -hmm. But we have also heard Charles Kolb say today that there seems to be a disconnect between the C-suite C -suite and K Street, and not just K Street, but the equivalent streets in Albany <laughs> and Sacramento <laughs> and the other 48 states. So how are you tracking implementation company-wide? Because you can adopt a policy at the top, but these corporations often have multiple subsidiaries and others that can take independent action. And I go back to the 80s when there was a big rush to adopt corporate privacy policies because the Europeans were adopting all of these personal privacy legislation. And about 120, 130 corporations mm 
with a lot of publicity, adopted personal privacy policies. But when we drilled down, and the we then was Business International, it didn't permeate very low, and the policies weren't followed. So in terms of the kind of negotiation you're doing with company, to what level of implementation are you getting, and how are you tracking that companies are really disclosing and not you know, giving money to citizens for the clean air, which is really supporting fracking? I mean, the companies that have adopted disclosure, uh, I mean, there are some that, frankly, honor agreements in the breach. You've had this with, uh, <clears throat> with WellPoint. And, um, you know, we, we go through and, uh, you know, try as much as possible to monitor the adherence. Uh, but the, the index is a very, very powerful tool for that. And uh, that's why we're doing it with the S&P 100 and then expanding it because you have the indicators which you will go through and you will check, you know, look at their policies and practices on their website. Uh, and we're using that as the tool for that. And then uh, going back and with those companies that have lower scores, uh, going, uh, that have agreed, adopted disclosure, re-engaging them. And that means re-engaging them directly with, by CPA, but also with our partners. I mean, doing it with the partners is extremely important because there is, a standing uh, that an agreement has, uh, you know, that allows uh, the partner to go in and uh, basically say, you know, you're not adhering to an agreement that you have reached with us, an agreement that does have some standing. Uh, I think, you know, when you talk about, when Charlie was talking about the disconnect between the C-suite and others, I mean, that's another interesting question. I was just speaking to the Council of Chief Legal Officers of, uh, uh, of the conference board, and there were 30 general counsels there from 34 companies. It was a, a very interesting mix because there were two folks from companies uh, that had adopted political disclosure and that were very open about why they did it and very positive and supportive. But then there were general counsels from other companies who were very hostile. So I think that uh, you know you need to deal with um, with folks at that level. Uh, you know, having groups like the conference board that are now supportive of, uh, of dealing with political spending and its risks is important because there is an education process that needs to, uh, to be continued and I think enlarged uh, to be able to get companies to recognize much more broadly that political disclosure and accountability is something that they need to do. I think you know, the, that's why when I talked about increasing the number of companies that, have adopted, uh, that adopt political disclosure, that's very important because it begins to create pressure on other companies that have not adopted to do so because it becomes a standard. I mean, moving from a best practice to a standard is very important because it creates those further pressures uh, to bring other companies into line. Uh, but there's a great deal of work to be done on this, and I think what you do is you have to look at it as a, a series of beachheads. You get in, you secure the beachhead, but then you have to start pushing inland, and that's one of the things that we're doing, and it's a long haul. Can I just follow up? What kind of support would help move that process along? Well, I mean, you, you have to have uh, from, uh, you know, foundation support, you have the resources to be able to do that. Uh, you know, we're working with, uh, with, with other organizations on this. That becomes extremely important. I think support in the business community is extremely important because political disclosure and accountability must be seen as something that's, that's acceptable but also something that, that is the norm that other the companies are expected to do. So that's why you know, we've been developing relationships with companies that want to be leaders on this. We work with them. We continue to enlarge that because it's very much like the ripple effect. You know, you're throwing the stone in the water and you want to throw in a larger stone and a larger stone and be able to, to, be able to, uh, you know, to change analogies to, uh, to be able to get more companies and more leading companies to adopt this. Thank you. Adam? You have a um, in the last uh, several days, we've seen a, a substantial an amount of attention to the leaked executive order um, that, that's, that's uh, come to public attention. And I just I wonder if anyone on the panel would have any thoughts to share either on the, the, the content of the order, or at least what we understand it to be, and, and the criticisms that have been leveled at, uh, at that. I can speak to the um, content of the order, which I went through um, rather quickly. Uh, what the order seems to say is um, that um, it, the, if an entity apl applies for, for an, a federal contract, 
um, it is required to disclose um, all contributions and expenditures to or on behalf of federal candidates, parties, and party committees um, made by the entity and its directors, officers, and any affiliates or subsidiaries, um, and then contributions made to third party entities um, with the intention or reasonable expectation that they'll be used um, for contributions or to make independent expenditures. And it's a look back of two years. So it's a very broad provision. And in terms of some of the criticism that we've seen uh, about that, in terms of violating NAACP and, and, and these cases that um, protected some anonymity in political speech, do you have any responses to any of that? Well, I'll just say very briefly um, that I, I'm not sure, uh, I'd have to think about it a bit more, but I'm not sure NAACP really is um, invoked here simply because um, this is the, the spender itself disclosing its contributions or independent expenditures. So no third party is being required to disclose um, receipts, its receipts. Um, I think that th some of the issues that have been discussed are um, very interesting. There was a whole discussion about how this interacts with the pay to play rules, which is very well worth um, uh, taking a look at. And we don't have time to talk about that here, but it's a very interesting issue. The second issue is the, the language in the second part of the um, draft order um, seems to talk about giving donations to third parties that ha where there's an intention or reasonable expectation. And those terms um, we know from the Disclose Act and other debates of a similar nature raise some significant issues about intent and how you determine that intent. I mean, the only thing I'd add, which is on a kind of a related point, is that um, I think there's probably no area of, at least on the campaign, on the campaign finance front, that is expanding more rapidly and dynamically than pay-to-play generally. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. the SEC has now adopted pay-to-play regulations. Um, G37, of course, been in place for a long time. But states, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different places um, uh, to look at. You know, law typically either follows the sort of the mini model where there's a federal statute and then mini state statutes mm -hmm. or the laboratories of democracy approach and pay to play is one of these areas where there's lots of laboratory laboratories of democracy going on and I suspect we will see more of that stuff bubble up to to various ideas for at the federal level um, with a panel like this with such well-established and well-known technical expertise and practical experience in this area, I want to nudge at you a bit more <laughs> to talk about what disclosure we think would be beneficial, what we mean by disclosure, and what we don't mean by disclosure, and where we think the pressure points of opposition may be. And I'm specifically interested in money trails, not just disclosing one's own activity, but the movement of money. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with the movement of money. But as Ellen and I know from the entities that we have represented and written about for more years than we're going to enumerate right here or anywhere <laughs> else, potentially, our entities serve as disclosure blockers or can and other entities say they want to disclose, but they may be relying on us as disclosure blockers. Um, and I will say about Common Sense 10, you got a great deal. You got corporate money for disclosure, and it was a wonderful bit of lawyering, and I thought it was terrific. Um, and um, one admires the ability to do this. And again, that's Citizens United, and fine. It's, but it was good, nevertheless, good lawyering. But if we're thinking about money trails and all the places where the block to disclosure can occur quite legally and even with good arguments about why that block to disclosure should occur, 
then it is fascinating to have the president's executive order um, with part two, and I knew Holly or somebody would have the exec, I couldn't be the only person with the executive order in my briefcase <laughs> today, but part B talks about these contributions to third parties. No reference to a charity carve out, um, no reference to tax exempt status, at different from taxable status. It seems quite broad, but I'd like to just take it out of the pay to play context, which I agree with you, Mark, is going to be a tremendous area of controversy um, and probably legislation. And just talk about money trails. What are the pressure points? What are the blocker entities? Do they necessarily have to be blocker entities? And the big question is, what do we mean by disclosure? Great question. And uh, Bruce, I think let's start with you, perhaps, because you work so closely with so many corporate I think Business you're right. You're absolutely right, and this is something that we have been very concerned about, and we do have an eye on because you can give money to an entity, and then that money goes further mm -hmm. along. You give it to a trade, so you know, you, you would give it to uh, to a 527 in the past, or then to a, or a trade association, and then it sort of moves along. Even if you give it to another pack, I mean, we've seen this in judicial races in the South. In Alabama, in particular, it's a daisy chain, and it's used deliberately to basically to hide the the source of of the money. Uh, pardon? Oh, it is it is laundering without without question. And you know, when we wrote the handbook, I just want to hold this up and make sure it's on the CPA website. You can get this from the conference board. The conference board was going to charge for this, but decided it was so important that it is now they are make, distributing free of charge. But in there, there is a footnote, footnote 45. It, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, we had to. <laughs> it answers all of our questions. We, we, no, we, we made sure that footnote 45 remained in. It kept going in and out, uh, but it is in. And it deals with Avon. And Avon discloses how its money is being used. Now, Avon is not a major contributor. You know, They agree to disclosure. They don't give direct uh, contributions, but they, they do their trade association payments. But they, they disclosed how some of the trade associations were using their money. They're not major trade associations, but it established a precedent. And that's why we included that, because in discussions with companies, we do talk about the, the importance, the need for companies to know how their money is being used, because as it goes down the line, the company is still associated. It is the origin of the money that is being used for various purposes that can create risk that can come back and bite them. And, uh, and, so, and, you know, and so we, you know, that is in there, and that's something that you know, we, we are beginning to discuss with companies. That's why we've been discussing this. I think this whole thing about companies placing restrictions on how trade associations can use their money is very important. You know, we've had candid discussions with companies where they've said, yes, you know, money is fungible, so we place a restriction and it means, you know, the trade association tells us, oh no, we're not using your money for that purpose. But you know damn well that either it is or that other monies are being used. It, it doesn't block, you know, other monies are being freed up. But I think companies rec are recognizing that this is something that they need to look seriously at. You know, some of them have said to us, Let's work on developing restrictions that are meaningful, that are effective. Uh, we know in the case of Wells Fargo, when they agreed to disclosure, that they, they said, you know, we're sending a letter to all of our associations stating that our money is not to be used for political purposes, and we're requiring the associations to acknowledge receipt of the letter and adherence to this. And in discussions with companies, you know, one of the, the corporate secretary of a leading company said, you know, this is something that's going to require getting a critical mass, and then once you achieve that critical mass, you know, then you begin looking at, at looking for the reduction in the amount of money that an association would have available for political purposes. But we're looking at, you know, asking associations to uh, companies to request from associations a report on how their money is being used. So, you know. There are ways that we are looking at through the whole corporate governance process and the agreements with companies to address that question because mm -hmm. it's something that needs to be addressed. Great, thank you. Um, I, I don't have an answer for you, <laughs> but um, I'll give a few thoughts because I think this is a very tricky issue. And I come at it largely from the perspective of organizations 
that are trying to be involved in the political process, they think in a be beneficial way. And um, the burdens of um, disclosure and even if they're very, very much of the, of the mind that disclosure is a good thing, um, the administrative burdens get to be slightly overwhelming, particularly if they take it very seriously. And um, it begins to discourage what is um, probably you know, very, very noble and good activity um, and furthering democracy. So uh, what I would say is one thing to do would be to sit down with these groups that are really trying to, that are not working on necessarily campaign finance reform, but are working on the types of issues that um, are, you know, social and economic issues, and say, how, you know, how would these proposals work for you? Because I think you'll, I think that that will be a very instructive exercise, um, with some with some really um, careful thought about what the implications would be of various disclosure regimes, particularly these ones that reach back um, and aren't just, you know, these are our donors, but those that say if you give with the intent and you know that sort of thing. Um, the second issue is um, when we talk about the responsibility for your donation through, the pro through a process, um, um, you get into situations where you do have um, you know, an organization that has a $3 million budget and makes $100,000 worth of independent expenditures, and you really do question whose money is it, and it would really be um, quite um, inaccurate to say it's, you know, one or another individual entity's money that was being used for this unless it was earmarked for that purpose. Um, on the other hand, disclosing all of the myriad, you know, millions of contributions that they received, big and small, um, would probably overload the disclosure system at, and, and make it really difficult for the public to use it in any um, useful way. And there's some actually very interesting language again, and I don't have it written down, so I'm probably going to get it slightly wrong, but um, in the MCFL decision, um, it talks about um, really two different types of contributions, one which the um, donor continues to have some role in or with, um, where they've earmarked the contribution, and another where there's really a delegation of authority, and they've just given because they very generally think this organization's going to do good things, and that's the end of their involvement. And I do think that's a very interesting conceptual issue that should be thought through in any disclosure regime. Um, one thing we might think about, not answering all of Fran's questions, is raising the threshold for disclosure. I mean, the IRS number of 5,000 or more seems more meaningful and may very well give the information that the public needs. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they need to know the tiny ones. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about the Disclose Act is the organizations it limited disclosure to. And if you had said, only these have to disclose, all sorts of other 501Cs would suddenly become vehicles, I believe, for this kind of activity. I'm still astonished, and friend and I could, that veterans organizations that are allowed to take deductions and can lobby and engage in political activities, I'm very <laughs> surprised that we don't see them as players in this area. And no one I've asked has said they have gotten to this area. But you start saying, telling C4s, 5s, and 6s that they can't, I bet we see 501C19s, veteran organizations, doing it. In the private foundation area, we have something called expenditure responsibility if a foundation makes a grant to something that is not a public charity. And there may be some places where we would require expenditure responsibility for certain kinds of grants. But Fred and I would have to talk together to figure out where <laughs> that line might be drawn. I just want to add just uh, very briefly to what Holly said. For, for many years, the opponents of campaign finance reform would regularly talk about if only we had disclosure, we wouldn't need all of it. And the disclosure was not just going to be disclosure, it was going to be instantaneous, it was going to be on the internet, it was going to be, it was going to be like billboards with disclosure. I mean, there's going to be disclosure, there's going to be disclosure everywhere you turn around, there'd be disclosure. And honestly, I, I thought, and maybe naively so, um, I thought that the Disclose Act 
was a was an effort to get at exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the criticism that came into the Disclose Act, I thought was unfair because it was precisely to try to get at those blockers, to use your term, and try to figure out, okay, let's get meaningful disclosure around this. And in the end, um, the opponents of Disclose didn't seem to come forward with any alternative compromised position to the internet real-time billboard, you know, <laughs> the sort of disclosure that they had talked about. And, and so I think that that's a real issue. And I think that in some ways it's unfortunate that the opponents of Disclose, rather than seeing that as a problem to help try to say, okay, we don't like exactly the way Disclose did it, so let's try to solve this problem a slightly different way, they, I think, instead just used it as an opportunity to oppose the bill, which I think was unfortunate. Um, I'm actually going to take the moderator's prerogative, to use Charles' term, to ask a follow-up. Because something I thought was interesting about the Disclose Act, um, or one particularly interesting aspect, was that it allowed a C4 organization that wanted to get involved in partisan politics to put aside some separate segregated funds, and then it would have to disclose um, individual donations when they were given to that fund so that we would avoid the problem that Holly mentioned where, you know, a, a Planned Parenthood type entity would be in a situation of having to disclose every um, person who had ever given a $50 donation, which I think strikes, um, you know, with my female sanity. I mean, that just seems crazy. And I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on that kind of compromise solution in the Disclose Act, whether you think it, it makes sense and whether you think it would work. Um, and that kind of segregated fund is available mm -hmm. under the regulations for electioneering and communications too to avoid um, disclosure of all, all contributions but to um, ha have a specially dedicated fund. What I, the little that I remember um, in <laughs> <laughs> looking at the disclosure, I had to block that period out months, of your mouth. <laughs> months ago and during the election cycle as well. So I, my um, attention was not entirely on it. Is that there, the one issue that is raised by that is because um, it, this is theoretically money that is going to be used in the political process. Um, it could raise 527 tax issues. I mean, is that separate segregated fund mm -hmm. um, actually a 527, um, a 527 yeah. tax entity, which you really get into complicated issues. I was issues astonished that nobody addressed that in any of the discussions. We did. This was. Okay, I missed yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, but I, there was seemed to me a very big issue about that. Yeah, that was why I remembered it. <laughs> but, but again, you know, it, it strikes me that we're in the, in the context of Congress passing a law, that's solvable because Congress could just change the law. Right. So if that's the basis upon which opponents of Disclose didn't want to support it, then, then let's, solve that, let's solve that issue through the, through the passage of the Disclose Act. Like I said, I, you know, in the end, uh, at least in some quarters, and I won't say universally, in some quarters there just seemed that having suggested that disclosure might be a solution when it actually was upon, uh, when it was actually upon them as an opportunity to discuss, here's a real piece of legislation, rather than saying, okay, we have to adjust this, you know, threshold up, or we have to deal with this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, deal with this tax-related tax issue, there was just a, a, there was no interest in engaging in that, and it was just an opposition. Well, in all fairness, if we had a majority rule Senate, we actually would have a disclosed that. Indeed. <laughs> Arguably, it was... It would have passed in a different universe. I think it got cloture. It got uh, one, one or two votes. Yeah, I think it was handful. 59 votes. Yeah. Um, Mark. Um, I was hoping that the panel could follow up on something that, uh, that Mark mentioned about political parties and sort of their role in this new Citizens United world. Um, I mean, certainly one of the concerns that, that I have and that I've heard a lot in a lot of quarters is that with all this new outside money coming mm -hmm. in, that the candidates who are actually accountable to voters and the political parties who are, who are at least somewhat accountable to voters um, are being pushed to the margins of elections. Um, and I think, as, as I believe Chair Bowerly alluded to earlier, there's been some research about the 2010 election showing that outside spending groups were much more likely than parties or candidates to run negative ads and that the groups that were not disclosing their funders were even more likely to be running negative ads and you know much more likely to be running misleading ads because at the end of the day nobody's going to really be calling them on it. Um, and so I'd be curious to know um, I guess what proposals the panel would have, I guess whether you share that concern and, and what you would think we should be doing to try to bolster the role of parties in the system. So uh, as the person who raised it, and I've talked a lot of, I've spoken a lot about this, let me put two, two concrete things on the table. And let me preface it by saying that for the reform community, I think they just have to 
each of you have to sort of make a decision here whether you want to actually sol help solve this problem by strengthening parties or whether it is simply a talking point to talk down corporate spending. Um, if you want to solve the problem of weak parties, I think there are a couple of things you could do. Number one, um, the Federal Election Commission took a statute that says FEC write new strict coordination rules for, ever, for ads run by everyone other than candidates and parties, and they wrote restrictions that applied to parties. It was an error when they wrote the rule. I believe it was, I don't believe it's consistent with McCain-Feingold. Uh, Commissioner Bowerly wasn't on the FEC at the time, but she's heard me say this before. The FEC tomorrow could open a rulemaking, change the coordination standard for parties, lower it significantly. I would bet you if the Democratic commissioners went along with that, I bet you the Republican commissioners would go along with it. It could be done, and if the reform community filed that petition, I bet you, I bet you it would go through. The second thing, which was part of at least part of the Disclosed Act in one of the two chambers, and I can't remember which, which actually was an amendment offered during McCain-Feingold by Senator Torcelli, which was then stripped out of Shays Meehan, uh, is to extend lowest unit rate to party committees. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make, you could significantly advantage party committees in buying television time by applying a more robust standard of lowest unit rate generally, but, but applying it uh, to the to uh, ads purchased by, by party committees. Those would be two things you could do that would strengthen the role of parties vis-a-vis -vis third party groups. Okay. Mark's the party man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that myself, but I thought I'd give everyone a um, well, I wanted to uh, return us for a second to um, talking about how to effectuate real disclosure of these issues, because I think that, as we saw in 2010 with so much dark political spending, that will really only continue as people learn how to play more you know, effectively and, and in a more sophisticated fashion in the current regulations, um, they'll be able to, to as Lance had called, launder uh, more of their money through organizations that, in fact, then don't have to share their true source of funds um, with the voters. And I wonder if you, uh, anyone on the panel thinks that the concept, um, particularly when we're discussing business corporations, that they would have to um, go through and disclose, these organizations would have to disclose under the concept of doing business as. So for example, groups, you know, when it was, I believe it was Littleton Neighbors for Sensible Development or something was almost entirely funded by Walmart. So if you're looking at an organization that receives um, a very high percentage of its funding from a specific source, and if that source is specifically a business corporation, um, but that we definitely have seen those uh, examples. And if you think that that concept of doing business as, which exists you know, in other elements of uh, corporate law, and I believe in regulations, although you would know more, um, if we could import that in a useful way. Um, and then generally on the, the, the developing narratives of disclosure, you know, recently we've seen all of uh, this attempt to portray disclosure, which used to be agreed upon. You know, they, they, they were for it before they were against it. Um, but suddenly uh, we're seeing this attempt to um, develop this idea that it is in fact chilling of speech or a burden of political speech. And I noticed, um, Professor Shadler, that you just had said that it begins to discourage participation. Um, and that's exactly um, the kind of uh, meme that uh, opponents of disclosure are trying to forward. So, you know, I think that we want to be really sensitive to how we discuss those things. So you can speak to those things. I don't know enough about doing business as, whether this is doing business, but it is similar to the suggestion I made about requiring disclosure along similar to the private foundation rules mm -hmm. when you have only a few donors which would be defined and that would catch these kinds of organization and not require Congress to go quite as far as it was clearly unwilling to go. One other thing I would add is that um, idea or that concept is certainly what is um, contemplated in the FCC petition, mm -hmm. um, that there would be some um, you know, percentage, 25 percent, or so that there's a minimum of four donors, uh, sorry, a maximum of four donors disclosed on any particular broadcast ad. Now that, of course, will only ever cover radio and television, um, but the same kind of provision can certainly be brought into um, other forms of disclosure. And for example, California has that um, has a provision for all political advertising, I believe, that um, requires the 
not only the name of the organization that's paying for the advertisement, um, whether it be a handbill or anything, um, newspaper, um, but also the major donors to that organization. Well, Right, but what I'm saying is it doesn't just cover broadcast. No, it covers right. everything, and mm -hmm. it basically says, you know, funding provided by and it's the top. Correct, uh, mm -hmm. right. Funders above $25,000. Right, but there are other, um, other t you know, states that do have this, not many, mm -hmm. but, but Washington. Um, Washington, it does sorry. cover other types of media is the point I was making. Great. I think we have time for one more question, and then do you want to? No. Okay. All right, Hi. one more question. Um, yes, actually, um, once we had Citizen United, the spending went up measurably, what was it, five times. I want to ask you to get, because you're on the front lines of dealing with these technical issues, to just assume for a second that we have disclosure, okay, and that it's, and that it's significant disclosure. We don't have a plethora of new veterans organizations and stuff. <laughs> so, so, Given that, is, <laughs> would you expect that that amount of money now being spent that's unaccountable to go down just by the fact of disclosure, or do you think it will have no effect? It's an interesting question, and I certainly don't know the answer. One of the things that I think about is um, in, I guess, 2000, when the um, Prior to 2000, 527 organizations right. were not required to file with the Internal Revenue Service and were not oh. required to um, disclose their donors over, I guess, $200. Um, everyone thought that when the new disclosure regime was instituted, that 527 money would significantly drop, and I don't believe that that was the case. Um, so I think it would be interesting to look back at that experience and see whether that's um, the case or whether really it would continue with fuller disclosure. And maybe partly because the IRS database wasn't very good. Huh, that would be too. <laughs> Yeah, my instinct, I, I, I have no idea, like Holly, I, I, I don't know. My instinct is, is along the lines of hers, which is that in 2004, we saw some very large 527s. And honestly, I mean, there you could speak to this, but honestly, 501c4s existed in 2004. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there was not this sort of sense of, oh my God, we can't be in a disclosure regime this needs to be in and not because there are trade-offs, right? There are there are if there are issues that involve primary purpose that make 501c4s less optimal mm -hmm. for some of this. Thing. And gift tax. And gift and right. gift 527s tax. 527s explicitly are not subject to gift tax. So you know, I like Holly. I'd be curious to see if there's any data to suggest mm -hmm. that at least in that experience there was any there was any dissuasion. But I think that you, you, disclosure can be helpful if it is followed up by uh, monitoring and then, frankly, by putting pressure. I mean, you saw this, you know, when I uh, referred to those 18 companies that, uh, that gave money to, uh, that disclosed their, their trade association payments, some of those, the 5.252 uh, million, uh, some of those uh, trade association, excuse me, some of the, um, the companies came under pressure from some of their shareholders. And I know of at least one case where a company has told a shareholder that it will reduce its payments to a trade association by half. And I think that if you're going to get about this type of change, then you need to have that type of pressure. That's why, you know, you have to have disclosure and accountability. And accountability means going in and looking at these things and taking a look at where the money is going, you know, how does it, uh, you know, are there conflicts with company values? You have to really tease all of these things out because what you have to do is raise the level of risk. But Bruce, aren't you seeing possibly what Fran talked about? So you've formed two trade associations. <laughs> one doesn't do the campaign intervention and they continue to give the money. And the ones who want to give the money to the campaign intervention, they go to the other trade association. No, but you're talking about, you know, trade associations such as the chamber. You're not going to have dual trade associations there. You're but smaller ones. The, the smaller ones are not, are not the major players. I mean, you know, when you're taking a look at the intervention in elections, you know, in this last election, it was the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you do have pharma that is involved, uh, you know, AHIP, the health insurance plans, they were involved. Uh, 
And you know, so you're, you're looking at a handful of associations, you know, and if they're going to, if companies are going to be involved, if associations are going to be involved, it's going to have to be significant amounts of money. Great. All right, so now we can have thunderous applause <laughs> for our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wonderful. And so now we have a short coffee and cookie break, I believe, and then the final panel will uh, begin.